Welcome to this brief tutorial on army planning. After getting my feet wet in the new version of the mod, I'm ready to start posting videos from the new campaign. But first I wanted to run through a few things that I do before I start a new campaign. Obviously every campaign requires you to go through the setup where you pick something from the West Point graduation. You notice that all three selections include uh, one in AO, so you have a minimum to field an army. Then something from the Mexican-American War. Then finally from your future career selection. If you put them in a grid, they might look like this, where you select one from each row. If I put them into a spreadsheet, you can see all 27 possible combinations. So a 1-2-2 two, two would be a tactician infantry army. Or a 2-1-2 two, two would be a strategist artillery army. Seeing them listed in the spreadsheet format helps me pick which points that fit whatever strategy I'm trying to employ for that particular campaign. For example, if I wanted to get out of the penalty for logistics and recon as soon as possible from the very start, then my only option is 131 because it's the only one that gives me the combination of two in logistics and four in recon. Politics will only ever be three or nothing, just as medicine will only ever be two or nothing. Economy can be zero, one, or three. Logistics and recon can be either zero, one, two, three, or four. And training has the most diversity with either a zero, one, three, four, six, or a seven to start out. AO is the only thing that can't start at zero, so it'll always be a one or a two. If you play the CSA, you can get away with just one in AO through Newport News. On the Union side, you'll need to use two prior to Distress Call. As I said in the overview video, it is important to understand when various aspects of career points take place. Both Philippi and Newport News are considered grand battles, so both politics and logistics will set their initial weapons amounts based on whatever you choose in the setup. Weapons recovery from recon and the number of casualties incurred at Philippi and Potomac Fort will also be affected by whatever you select here. On the other hand, economy, training, and AO offer extremely little value in the outcome of the events of the first battle. AO may give you a couple extra soldiers from uh, returning from the missing in action immediately after the battle. And training, if you have an officer wounded or killed, will give you a little bit of a boost into their replacement. Keep that in mind when making your campaign setup choices. For example, if you wanted to get six in training right away, you may find that you're better off taking a 2-1-2 or a 2-3-2 that gives four in training while providing boost to a logistics and medicine or to logistics and recon, then using your two career points from the first battle to get training the six, since it won't really start having any meaningful effects until after the second battle. Another big choice to make is where you plan to amass your weapons to build your army, and you basically have three paths with the new mod. The traditional way would be to buy your weapons from the shop. In version 1.28, you can pump up logistics to get larger weapons caches from the government and buy them with your reputation points. In the previous version of the mod, you could use the base weapons recovery to get weapons. But in 1.28, you can pump recon to boost the recovery to much larger numbers. I'm not going to say much about the traditional method of using logistics with economy and politics to get weapons, other than to say the logistics can now be increased higher than the previous version of the mod. Some of the pros and cons of this method are that you have more control over what weapons you use than the other two methods. It's also the easiest way to get heavy guns and specialty weapons for your cav and skirmishers. Increasing logistics, economy, and politics can help you overcome some of the limits of the base values of money, cost, and supply. The downside is that you're restricted to whichever weapons are available to your side, so the, whether it's the, it's the Union or the CSA. But it's all very consistent and predictable for planning purposes. The pros and cons of using politics to get weapons via reputation points include the fact that you don't need any money to do it. The opportunity cost is giving up morale bonuses in order to get equipment. 
Some very large caches of weapons can be available after certain battles. You have a very limited assortment of weapons as compared to what's available in the shop if you are buying them, and there's also a limited supply, but this method is also very consistent and predictable for planning purposes. Here is a breakdown of what the government weapons caches look like for the Union and the CSA. Starting out, you will have either a 0 or a 3 in politics, so I've grayed out the other configurations since you can't get them. So as the Union, you'll either have 2,055 Springfields or 2,340 available, along with either 6 ordnance rifles or 8. I'm not including the officers that can be taken, but you can see how the multiplier uh, from points in politics affects the sizes of the available weapons. After Malvern Hill and Second Bull Run, the base amounts of Lorenz and 61 Springfields jumps way up, and it cascades into very high numbers with politics. Obviously, you can amass a lot of 20-pound parrots this way, too. 1863 Springfields become available via rip points after Antietam. Starting with Stones River, you get some cab and skirmisher weapons starting to appear to order with rep points, and Joslin rifles start to appear after Gettysburg. Chickamauga and Cold Harbor round out the final grand battles before the climax at Richmond. There's lots of premium weapons to be had there at the end. Taking a look at the CSA campaign, you get a nice number of infantry weapons to start out. Post Gaines's Mill gives you two separate caches of 53 Enfields. The CSA gets a pretty nice assortment of weapons, but they don't get the big jump in numbers like the Union does after Melbourne Hill and Second Bull Run. I don't know what happened to Chickamauga, but CSA seems to have gotten shorted there. The cab weapons throughout the CSA campaign are top-notch, and their EN-53s come with 80 melee, something that the Union doesn't get with their most used weapons until Joslin rifles come around towards the end of the campaign. One last thing about determining the overall value of items listed in the government supply menu is that you can use some simple math to determine the value of all items by equalizing them for the value of a single reputation point. That is for everything except for the recruits. For example, let's say I have three in politics and zero in economy after Shiloh. Determining the value of cash is easy since you just take the dollar amount and divide it by the reputation points that it costs you. In this case, $117,000 divided by 18 reputation points gives it $6,500 per reputation point. For weapons, I need to look up how much it costs in the shop first. With no points yet in the economy, a Lorenz rifle costs me $58. So I multiply 58 by 2,340 and that'll give me a total cost of 135720 and then I divide that by 13 rep points to get a value of $10,440 per reputation point. I then apply the same formula to the Springfields and the 20-pound parrots. So if you're just going by the value of reputation points, then the Lorenzes give me the highest return per reputation point with the Springfields just a hair less. The cash is the third best, and the parrots would be last. However, I only have two parrots in my shop to buy, so if I don't take them with reputation points, I just don't get any for a while. So the scarcity of a weapon in your shop may cause you to go against the per rep point value. That is just a jumjama call that you have to make when building your own army. And over time, you'll notice that as you get more and more points into economy, the value of the cash will eventually surpass the weapons. For example, if I had 10 in economy here and applied the exact same formula, the cash would have more value than anything else. Of course, the nice thing about cash is that you can buy whatever you want and you're not limited to just what's in the government menu there for reputation points. Looking at the pros and cons for using weapons recovery, of course, there's no money involved, which is always a plus, but the early campaign weapons tend to be a pretty low quality. Lots of SP-42s, muskets, rebores. When you eventually get points into economy, you can sell those weapons to buy other things that you need. 
You're mostly fighting with the enemy's own weapons, so if you play the CSA, it's a good way to get Union Heavy Artillery, and if you play the Union, it's a good way to get the CSA Sniper and Cav weapons. If you don't put anything in logistics, you're going to have a very limited supply of weapons, especially for heavy guns and sniper rifles in the shop supply, so that's a limitation. Whereas the number of weapons you can get from buying them in the shop or using reputation points is pretty consistent and predictable based on your career point allocation, there are a lot of variables that go into determining what weapons and how many you'll get from weapons recovery. Anything that affects scaling will affect the size of the AI forces, so what difficulty you're playing on, whether or not you full cleared the battle or not, how many did you capture, how many units did you shatter. Some weapons are more common at various battle, but there's always a variance chance that they can result in the AI using higher quality weapons. For example, when playing the Union on Major General, you can't really count on getting 400 yard range rifles with over 40% accuracy until after Shiloh. But variants could allow the AI to use Mississippis or Harper's Ferries, Lorenzes, or even 24-pound Parrots in battles that are before that. So going the weapons recovery route is sort of the Forrest Gump box of chocolates method. You never know what you're going to get, even though you may know the odds of getting certain weapons at certain times in the campaign. With that said, let's look at one possible scenario. These are my actual weapons recoveries for Shiloh with 3 and Recon which is uh, 0.9 or 90% of what they would have been in version 1.27. I then forecasted what they would be with 4, 6, 8, and 10 points in recon in the same battle. These numbers are on major general difficulty. The numbers will be lower on legendary and higher on brigadier general and colonel difficulties. Keep in mind that rescued weapons reflect what you and your allies took to the battle, and the captured weapons reflect what the AI took to the battle. At Shiloh, all of Buell's forces carry 42 Springfields. The AI on Major General normally has a combination of rebores, 42 Springfields, and 55 Springfields. Variance in this battle has them with some 53 Enfields, some Mendenhall, Jones, and Gardners, which are the MJ and G rifles. As you can see, Recon can get quite powerful on weapons recovery. And the further you go into the campaign, the better weapons you'll get from the enemy while losing fewer of your own. I will start posting a new campaign very soon so you can see some of the changes to 1.28 in battle, along with some possible strategies that you may want to employ, or you may want to avoid if you see that I'm getting smoked, because everyone out there is still trying to figure this out. Thank you for watching, and come back for the campaign.